cominciamo con il secondo talk della giornata, Marco Bonzanini uh, con uh, Word Embedded uh, NLP in Python. E Marco Bonzanini, Bonzanini eh, sta anche um, seguendo e organizzando un uh, meetup about uh, Python and PyData eh, in London. E, oh, sorry, I should probably speak in English. <laughs> Um, so there is a meetup in London about uh, data science in Python, and uh, he's running uh, every month. So if you're in London or traveling in London, I suggest you to have a look. Um, and so we're ready to start. So a uh, uh, great welcome to Marco, and uh, enjoy the talk. Thank you. So uh, this talk is about natural language processing. And uh, yesterday, we had fun with the, with the workshop, the introduction to natural language processing for beginners. So this one is somehow uh, a follow-up of, of the workshop, a uh, uh, more advanced uh, concept on word embeddings. But hopefully, uh, this is still for beginners. So there will be some, uh, some theory, but not too much. It's more about the, the general overview, the general intuition behind the word embeddings, what they are, why we use them, and so on. Uh, so, about myself, uh, I'm a scientist, I'm based in London, and uh, most of what I do nowadays is Python and uh, text analytics. Uh, some of my experience ended up uh, in this book about data mining for uh, social media, published with, uh, with Pact Publishing. And uh, as Stefania mentioned, I'm one of the co-organizers of uh, PyData London, which is one of the uh, biggest uh, local uh, user groups. Uh, for Python. So we have uh, a monthly event with uh, a lot of nice people and uh, we are also organizing an annual conference which is coming up in May, so in a few weeks. You can, chat, you can check it out, it's really interesting stuff going on. Now, uh, word embedding. So the way this talk is structured, first uh, the, the overall uh, kind of informal introduction to word embeddings and the intuitions behind them. Uh, what they are, what we want from them, and then later on a bit of theory followed by a little bit of practice uh, in Python. So, terminology, word embeddings essentially are vectors representing words. So these are all uh, synonyms, word embeddings, word vectors, distributed representations, sometimes you see also uh, semantic vectors. This essentially means um, all the same uh, uh, concept. And uh, why is this important? Well, just like in uh, data mining, essentially the way you represent the data is crucial for the success of your application. Uh, also in text mining, the way you represent your text is crucial for the success of your task. And in terms of applications, uh, really anything related to natural language uh, potentially can benefit from uh, using these uh, word embeddings. Uh, so I just want to mention a few applications, classifi classifications, recommended systems, uh, search engines, so when you type in uh, your query and then uh, the search engine has some interpretation, some semantic interpretation of your query, and then also machine translation and many, many more. Uh, this is just to give you a brief overview. In terms of uh, representing uh, our data, I just want to mention a couple of options that are sort of well known, well understood uh, in uh, uh, text mining. So the first one is called one-hot encoding. In uh, one-hot encoding, essentially, you have uh, vectors representing words. And uh, this is what they look like. So we have zeros everywhere. And then you have uh, only one bit being hot. So essentially, each dimension of the vectors represent a particular word. And then for the single word vector, you will have the uh, relevant position being switched on to one. There's one problem with this uh, representation, which is dimensionality. So the number of dimensions is huge. That's the size of the uh, vocabulary. Another problem is uh, you don't really have a notion of similarity between these vectors, right? Because only one dimension is, uh, is switched on. Anyway, this is a fairly common uh, option. And uh, another one that I want to mention is the bag of words approach. Uh, that's used for documents. So with a bag of words, Essentially, documents are represented as vectors. So here you see uh, a few documents, and uh, also each dimension 
is uh, representing a particular word. So in this example, document one has the word uh, Rome coming up 32 times, the word Paris coming up 14 times, and so on. And here you still have the dimensionality problem. You have a lot of dimensions. But you start having some, uh, some notion of similarity, because at least you can somehow match the dimensions between uh, vectors. And these are fairly common, fairly well understood in uh, text mining. Now, uh, moving on to word embeddings. This is what they look like. Uh, so they're vectors. They're vectors of real numbers. And uh, what do we want exactly from them? We want the number of dimensions to be much, much smaller than the vocabulary size, usually 2, 300. That's quite common. And then we want to uh, have some notion of similarity between words. So if you notice, uh, some of the dimensions here between Rome and Paris, for example, are kind of close to each other. So Rome and Paris are similar. They're both cities. They're both in Europe. But they're both capitals and so on. So we want to capture these similarities. Similarly, Italy and France, they're similar. Uh, they're both uh, countries. They're both in Europe. They're both uh, nice places to visit and so on. So a few dimensions are sort of close to each other. But also Rome and Paris, uh, sorry, Rome and Italy have uh, something in common, right? So Rome is the capital of Italy, so there is some sort of semantic relationship going on, and we want that to be captured by some of other dimension, and uh, likewise uh, between Paris and France, of course. So this example is a bit made up just to showcase what's going on with, uh, with these word embeddings. And uh, if we look at them uh, in, uh, in picture, so Rome and Paris, they are close to each other, they're similar. And then Italy and France, they're also similar, so they're close to each other. And uh, if you notice, there's a kind of a direction, Rome to Italy, capital of, and Paris to France, capital of. So you have this semantic relationship being, uh, being captured here. So this is basically the, the magic with uh, word embeddings. So if you start with a vector for Paris, you add uh, the vector for Italy, and you remove the vector for France, you end up with a vector which is very, very close to the vector for Rome. So you can uh, map these relationships, semantic relationships, uh, with these analogies. So that's the, the overall idea of uh, how word embeddings uh, look like. Uh, we don't have vectors yet. We, we have language. So we want to end up with vectors. So what's the main uh, linguistic uh, intuition behind them? The main linguistic intuition is called uh, the distributional hypothesis. And uh, this is nothing new. This is something that comes from, from the 50s, essentially. And uh, in every word embedding talk, uh, you see this, uh, this quote being referenced by uh, this British uh, professor of linguistics from uh, 1957. You shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, there is also another reference that is maybe a bit more clear. So words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meaning. So in summary, we have a word. We want to represent the meaning of a word. And we can approximate the meaning of a word using the context, so using the surrounding of uh, a word. So I'll just give you an example. This is a sentence. I enjoyed eating some pizza at the restaurant. And to make it more credible, I actually did enjoy some pizza last night. So we focus on uh, what's important here. This is our focus word. and. Uh, this is the company it keeps. So if we want to capture the meaning of the word pizza, we just look around it. So pizza is something we eat. Pizza is something we have at the restaurant. Pizza is something we enjoy. And then if you picture it on a larger scale, people describe the word pizza in many, many different ways. And when you aggregate everything together, you have the true deep meaning of the word pizza. Counter example, we have two sentences. So I enjoyed uh, some pizza, I enjoy some Fiorentina. So these are our uh, focus words. And uh, if you notice here, we have exactly the same context. So according to what I told you so far, essentially we are saying uh, pizza and Fiorentina are exactly the same. So this is, of course, outrageous. But again, picture it on a larger scale. So people describe these terms with, uh, in, in many, many different ways. Some people might even not enjoy pizza. So uh, that's how it is. Now, moving on with a bit of uh, 
a bit more details on the theory. Um, so word embeddings are, are the vectors, but we also say word embeddings as, as the algorithms to get the vectors. And uh, it's a family of algorithms. And in particular, I want to mention word to vec as uh, a popular option. It was essentially the first uh, big uh, breakthrough with, uh, with these word embeddings. And uh, this happened a few years ago, uh, 2013. And uh, these guys from Google, Thomas Mikolov and, uh, and colleagues, they published a couple of papers, efficient estimation of word representation in vector space, and also distributed representations of words, phrases, and their compositionality. And the concepts from these papers, they ended up in what, what we know today as uh, <coughs> word to vec So uh, we need to get vectors, so we want to calculate this vector. So the goal is to, to learn uh, word vectors. Now, uh, if, you, if we look at things from a distance, uh, everything in machine learning kind of looks the same. So we start with uh, choosing an objective function. We initialize randomly our vectors, and then we run uh, stochastic gradient descent until we get the vectors. So uh, if you've done some machine learning before, maybe you've seen the same process in uh, different tasks. So maybe what's interesting here is uh, what's going on with the objective function. So again, taking the, the previous example, we have a word and we have context of the word. So essentially our objective here will be to maximize the likelihood of uh, the context word given the focus word. So uh, we're going to end up with a bunch of probabilities that look like this. So probability of observing a context word given that we observe the focus word. So uh, a few more details with this example to see how the, the algorithm is actually working. Uh, same sentence as before. We have our context word, sorry, we have our focus word and uh, we want to iterate over all the context words. So we start from the beginning of the sentence. I see the word uh, I, even that I'm uh, focusing on the word pizza, so I bump the probability for I given pizza and then I move on. I see the word enjoyed and I bump the probability of enjoy given pizza. I see the word uh, eating and I bump the probability of uh, eating given pizza. And then we iterate all the way until the end of the sentence. Once we get to the end of the sentence, we move on to the next uh, focus word and repeat. So. I see I given at, and I bump the probability of I given at. I see enjoyed, and I bump the probability, and uh, get a picture of what's going on here. So this is a nested for loop, and uh, the, the, the core of the matter here is bumping these probabilities. I mentioned these probabilities, this conditional probability of a context given uh, a focus word, and uh, we, we have define the probability yet, so there are some, uh, some question marks here. What's going on with the probability? Now to generalize, we call the focus word also input word and the uh, context word as the output word. We want the probabilities to be dependent on the vectors, so we can uh, redefine uh, the probabilities in this way, probability of observing vector for a word given vector for the focus word. So in the general case, we, we essentially rewrite uh, uh, the probability in this way, probability of uh, output vector given the input vector. This is just the, to generalize the case. And uh, we still haven't defined it. So uh, the next step is to work on this. Now, we have this probability between vectors. Ideally, we want uh, the probability to be high when the vectors are similar. So we have a notion of vector similarity here. and. Uh, a fair option is uh, to consider cosine similarity. It's quite a common way to, to compute similarity between vectors. One problem is uh, cosine similarity is not a probability. So it's a number between uh, minus 1 and 1. The next idea, we take the cosine similarity, we throw it in a softmax uh, function, and uh, the output of a softmax is a number between 0 and 1, so it looks like a probability, and it actually has a probabilistic uh, interpretation. And uh, if you want a big scary formula, that's how softmax uh, looks like. So we have an exponential of the cosine, 
and then you normalize it over sum of all the exponentials um, across the vocabulary. If you've done some uh, some machine learning before, be maybe this is nothing new. And uh, if you're new to this, maybe this one looks scary. So you can kind of forget about the details uh, of this formula and just focus again on uh, looking at things from a distance. So the process of calculating the vectors, essentially, we want to learn what vectors. We do so by using stochastic gradient descent. And uh, we do it on the softmax probability. So this this is the overall process. Here you have all the keywords if you want to look up for the for the details. And uh, if you're not scared about the probability this uh, theory yet, there's a little bit of a twist. Uh, so these guys wrote uh, some uh, some follow-up of the work to create uh, distributed representations of uh, sentences or paragraphs or documents. So the focus here is we can learn vectors for documents. The algorithm uh, in the paper is uh, referred to as paragraph vector, but then to reference word to vec, they also call it uh, doc to vec. And uh, it's basically the same process, so we have a very similar probability, but you see here the conditional probability also has uh, a label, and uh, the label could be a document ID, it could be a sentence ID, a class ID, it depends on how we want to aggregate uh, these probabilities, but pretty much. Uh, the same, uh, the same process. Okay. Uh, now, word to vec became very, very popular because uh, it was an academic success on one side, but also on the other side, they released the uh, the tool, open source uh, this tool written in C from Google to calculate these vectors, and uh, they also released uh, the vectors themselves. So they trained the vectors on the Google News Corpus. So they have billions of words, essentially, and they are already there. So you can use them. Uh, you can kill the training time to zero, essentially, and use the, uh, the vectors from Google. The tool is written in C, and uh, we care about Python. So uh, in Python, there's this library called uh, GenSim for topic modeling. And uh, what they do is uh, they implement a lot of uh, this topic modeling algorithm. So there's a lot of stuff for natural language processing. And uh, it's implemented in a way that is very efficient on one side. But for us as uh, developers, users, essentially the interface is super simple. So the, um, the pan line for them is topic modeling uh, for humans. So it's very, very easy to, to use. And this is the just a screenshot of their GitHub uh, page. So to get started, uh, basically pip install Gensim, or if you prefer conda install uh, Gensim, and you're good to go. And uh, I want to give you a couple of examples of uh, uh, real life uh, kind of scenarios uh, to use this word embedding. So first, uh, uh, this is some work that I've done with a client of mine. So they have a platform for uh, recruitment. You kind of upload your CV on one side, uh, companies upload a job specification on the other side, and then there is some machine learning magic to match the right people to the right job. And we did this little pilot to, to check out what's going on with the word embeddings. So we had a bunch of uh, resumes. Each uh, resume has uh, a number of experiences, and each experience has a number of skills associated to it. And uh, essentially, we treat our experiences as sentences, and the skills are our terms. So we ended up with, the, with a vocabulary of uh, about 15,000 unique skills. For the coding side, uh, fairly simple. So you import the, the word to vec class. We had our data, in this case, in a JSON line format, but it doesn't really matter. The, uh, the custom part is the third line. So you need to write your corpus reader. And uh, you can do so in a way that uh, essentially yields one uh, experience at a time. So you, do you don't need to load the whole uh, data set in memory. You just need to uh, yield one uh, sample at, uh, at a time. And then you load it up with the uh, word to vec class that is going to train the model. And uh, I'm kind of hiding a lot of the details here on, on the last line. You can uh, pass a few optional arguments to choose number of dimensions that you want to choose the size of your contest to choose a couple of things but uh, you know from a distance this is what it looks like so you train your model 
when you train your model, then you can uh, look up for uh, uh, your terms. So, for example, given the word chef, we have a vector for chef, and here we see the vectors that are closer to chef. So a chef is a cook, that they are synonyms, so the two vectors are very similar. And then we observe uh, basically a bunch of uh, uh, job titles or a bunch of skills in the kind of food industry, restaurant industry, and so on. So bartender and waitress, they're not really chefs, but they are kind of, you know, working together. So that's pretty interesting. And uh, then the twist is, the, is this magic with the word embedding. So you take the vector for chef and you remove the vector for food. You end up with a vector which is close to all these guys here, Puppet, Ansible, Salt, and Chef itself. They are all uh, libraries and tools for uh, DevOps. Okay. So same, same word, chef, used in different context. And uh, playing with this vector arithmetic, essentially, you end up with uh, the vectors that you want. And, uh, and that's, that's really, uh, really powerful, really meaningful, especially uh, for us during the, the kind of exploratory steps. So we found this uh, uh, word embeddings to be extremely useful to understand our data, so for data exploration. And then later on uh, in this uh, recruitment platform, we also implemented a lot of uh, semantic uh, interpretation of your queries, uh, expansion, suggestion, and so on, recommendations. So essentially, people who use the system, they type in something, and then the system can understand uh, you know, what are the skills to suggest in this case. So that was really an interesting one. This one? You have vectors, you take the vector for chef, learn from your training data, you remove the vector for food, you end up with a vector which is similar, close to this ones. So there's a new vector, that you don't have it in your vocabulary. But that vector will be very close to Puppet, DevOps, and then Ansible. That's what the data look like. That so if you have a CV and you are a chef, your words will be similar to chef. But if you are a DevOps, you've been using Chef, you've been using Puppet, you've been using Salt. These are all names of libraries that are in the same space. Chef, Ansible, Puppet, Salt, they're all tools for DevOps. <coughs> now, on a lighter note, uh, kind of a side project of mine. Uh, I like beer, I like data, I like Python. So I did the only reasonable thing to do put everything together. So this there's a data set uh, of beer reviews from Rate Beer, about three million. So many beer reviews about many different beers, and there are many different beer styles. So these are some numbers. You can see there are, there are a lot of words. So beer fanatics uh, talk a lot about beers. And uh, the process here is kind of similar, but we're using Doc2Vec in this case. So it looks pretty much the same. Import the, the class, you have your data, this time it was in, uh, in CSV, and then uh, the custom uh, corpus reader, the third line, uh, will need to yield uh, one review at a time together with the beer style in this case. If you remember the doc to vec uh, probability has uh, an extra label in the, in the condition, and the label in this case is the beer style for me. So I want to aggregate this review according to beer style. And then I load up uh, the, the corpus in the doc2vec and I train my model. And again, there are a few extra arguments. Uh, about one gigabyte of data, there's a bit of uh, pre-processing and then the training takes a bit of time. So on my laptop, it was a bit more than uh, three hours. So the, the uh, suggestion is remember to persist your model so you don't need to retrain every time. Don't close your Jupyter notebook without saving the model. Now we have document vectors with uh, doc2vec, okay? So model dot uh, docvex, and we want to check out how the styles are considered similar. So stout is a style of beer, style of black beer, and the similar styles are all the uh, kind of black beers here. So sweet stout, dry stout, porter. That's uh, that's kind of uh, what it is. So people describe different beers using words that are similar. And uh, if you carry on with the with this list you end up with uh, other styles that are less similar, but they're still black. 
So there's a notion of color uh, being uh, captured. And if I want to check out uh, what are the words that the people use uh, most to represent this particular stout, uh, style, so stout, you know, it's black beer, so hints of uh, coffee, hints of uh, charcoal, if you want, uh, kind of burn taste, roasted taste. So these are the most common uh, uh, terms for the style stout. And uh, as a counter example, if we have uh, a wheat beer, lemony, orangey, zesty, kind of aroma, coriander seeds, and so on. So these are the terms used to describe this particular style, and it all makes sense. And just to go one step further, uh, if you take all these vectors, so we have two, three hundred dimensions, throw them in a principal component analysis, so we end up with uh, two dimensions. We can map uh, the styles on uh, on this plot here, uh, so we have one dot for each style. Uh, we don't see any kind of explicit uh, clustering here, but uh, we still have some notion of similarity. So what I observed, essentially, similar beers, they kind of group uh, together. So we have the dark beers on one side, uh, and interestingly, the, the horizontal direction is the color. So all the uh, lager and uh, white beers, they are on the left, all the red and brown in the middle, and all the black they are on the right. I guess this is a bit random, but that's what happened. Strong beers together, sour beers uh, kind of on a different league, and then the, the lagers and the wheat beers, they are kind of all together. This was a bit of a, a, bit of a toy example, a bit of a joke for me. Um, so useful, of course, to plan my next pint. But again, this is really about understanding, having a deep understanding of your data. So essentially understanding how people talk about a particular topic, uh, and it could be any uh, domain model here. And uh, I'm not showing any code, but I also use uh, this data for a classification task. So given a review, can I predict uh, what kind of style they are describing? And I notice using uh, word embeddings, you have uh, uh, much better results than uh, uh, using just bag of words or the, the kind of traditional approaches that you have in text classification. Okay, now uh, kind of just wrapping up. Uh, so this is nothing new in a sense uh, because we've been doing uh, stuff based on co-occurrences uh, for a while and just I want to mention a few examples, LSA, LDA, these algorithms, they've been around for a while and they're all based on co-occurrences but word embeddings uh, learned with word to vec and or similar algorithms usually uh, produce a much better representation of your data. So the traditional approaches are kind of outperformed. And uh, word to vec also scales much, much better. So you have a large scale uh, uh, opportunity here compared to all these other traditional approaches. So there's a notion of efficiency. The first paper of word to vec starts with efficient representation. So that's the, that's the focus, efficient representation. Because they're based on uh, co-occurrences, but there is no co-occurrence matrix in memory. So you don't need to load the co-occurrence matrix in memory. Vectors are learned as you go directly. So that's interesting. And uh, I mentioned the softmax uh, to compute the probability, and uh, it has a complexity which is based on the size of the vocabulary. That could be very, very huge. Uh, there's a trick, anyway, that's called hierarchical softmax. Uh, I don't even remember all the details about the um, how you compute it, but there's essentially a binary tree involved, and you end up with a probability with a complexity that is uh, logarithmic rather than linear to the vocabulary size. So that's again uh, this efficient aspect. Garbage in, garbage out, uh, kind of classic uh, in uh, in machine learning. So pre-processing is still very very important and your business domain is very, very important. So Google offers the pre-trained vectors for you. They're very useful until they're not useful. So the pre-trained vectors are trained on uh, the Google News corpus. So this general purpose news, US-oriented kind of news, uh, general English. So there's a good chance that your particular domain, your particular task is not general purpose news, general English. So you need to train uh, 
your vectors depending on your particular domain. And if you have a very small data set, maybe word embeddings are not showing any particular uh, interesting uh, aspect. But if you have a few thousand words, and even more if you have a million words or more, uh, yeah, absolutely train your own model. And to conclude, so all this word uh, arithmetics, they look like magic. Uh, really, it's a big victory for unsupervised learning. And uh, the nice thing is you can kind of ignore all the theory and just use GenSync with a very nice interface. And uh, yeah, I just want to mention, uh, just want to say thank you to a couple of people. So Lev is a friend of mine who works on uh, GenSync. He's also around the, the PyData London. And uh, he gave me this T-shirt. So Jensen is sponsoring my outfit today. Uh, Chris Moody, I haven't met the guy. So he has uh, a couple of uh, great uh, presentations on uh, LDA and uh, word embeddings and all the stuff. So you can check him out on, on YouTube. And if you want to know more about the, the theory, there's a lot of stuff going on online, especially uh, these uh, online classes with, uh, with Stanford. They're really good. Okay, so this is essentially all for me. Uh, the slides are online. I'm easy to find online. And uh, we have time for questions now, but I'll be around anyway today and tomorrow. So, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Marco, a lot. Are there any questions around? Which are the performances, the standard performances of these things? Can you use them in real time? For example, for a, for a um, uh, colloquial interaction, for example. So there's a training phase. Yes. And that it, it depends on the size of your vocabulary. Sure. And then once you have the vectors, uh, if you want to compute similarity, yes. um, it's nearly, nearly it's instant. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. But the, the training phase, yeah, fine, it, fine. It, it can take. Uh, Seconds, minutes, minutes, months, uh, depending on the size of your data. Yeah, once the learning is, date, is, is done, so the, yes. the reply yes. is almost yes. instantaneous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Can you tell a bit more about the pre processing steps? Like, is it, I think it's very important to to get rid of spelling uh, differences or typos or the yes. mo other more? Or yes, I, I very much agree. Preprocessing is still very important. Uh, in these examples, I only did uh, basic tokenization and uh, um, kind of lower casing, and that's it. I didn't bother with the stemming or uh, stop or removal and so on. So you have a, an option to choose uh, what you want to do here. Uh, for example, with the uh, skills and CV, the first, uh, the first use case, we didn't have uh, proper English. We didn't have uh, like a grammatical sentence. We had just a list of skills thrown in as a sentence. So that's not proper English. But still, you can see the co-occurrences. Another option is to use a proper sentence. And then if you use a proper sentence, you can choose uh, between passing everything, everything minus top words, uh, doing some normalization, and you can observe some uh, some different results. Uh, I think the uh, the basic steps that you you can kind of think of off the top of your head are uh, all you need uh, to get started. But of course, during uh, if this is an R and D process, you will need some iterations. So just there's a bit of try and error um, to find the optimal solution. But um, yeah, you need to work on it a little bit. Uh, but it's not it's not in uh, it's not in particularly um, tedious because uh, if you have enough data, this uh, um, these approaches will pick up uh, uh, on these uh, semantic similarities uh, quite easily. You have more than one million words in your in your data, which is not a huge data set. That's really nice talk. <coughs> is is there a link between the <coughs> the vectors um, that you obtain with this method and what some people call topics? Want to hear that? Uh, 
So you're thinking about LDA, essentially, kind of, yeah. Uh, n uh, not much, not much. Uh, if you take the vectors uh, after the, the training itself, uh, you can cluster them and see what's going on. So that, uh, if you have a little cluster of vectors, maybe you have a topic. Uh, but the idea is you, if you do this arith arithmetic, so you sum and uh, subtract vectors, you end up to kind of the, the concepts that you want to highlight. Uh, I think there is no explicit uh, uh, notion there. If you check out the, the videos by Chris Moody, he's been working on LDA to VEC, which is kind of on a hybrid uh, LDA embeddings kind of approach, and that's quite interesting stuff. I didn't dig into the theory yet, I just checked the, the presentation. Uh, so that's maybe one direction that you might want to explore. Hi. I have a, que a simple question. Yeah. <coughs> uh, this data set was uh, uh, the same language, I think. Yes. Or yeah. With, uh, when you have a different type of language, uh, for example, Italian, English, or more difficult language like Chinese, something like how could you do uh, mm, similar metrics? You have to force to divide and uh, do a ranking for different language, or you have uh, to, you could mix in some manner? So multiple languages in the same data set without a label? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I haven't explored anything like that. So I guess you need to f somehow to label the languages that were released, and the language identification is a fairly well understood task with a kind of 99% accuracy. So you can run a, a classifier and identify your languages. You mentioned Chinese. Chinese also has a problem with tokenization, which is very, very difficult. So that's another story. Um, I've seen a few papers where word embeddings have been used successfully for machine translation. So you train uh, your vectors for English, and you train your vectors for Italian or Spanish. And the vectors, essentially, there's just a kind of a rotation going on. so that Y you can map the vectors quite easily, and uh, they are very accurate with uh, large data sets, uh, but it's not really my my usual um, kind of task. So I'm I've, I've seen something in that direction, but I'm, I'm not sure about the details. A few questions. <laughs> um, I'm, I missed a step because yeah. I'm tired, I think. Um, you said one of the important points was your vectors have much smaller dimensions yep. than the vocabulary. Is that something you force? You say, "I'm going to def I'm going to only have five, and then you do the gradient descent or the." You, you yes, you cho you choose uh, you choose the dimension for these vectors, and uh, as a rule of thumb, uh, less than 100 dimensions is kind of not enough. Usually, people do two, three hundred. More than 1,000 dimensions not needed. So it's about efficiency. So less dimensions means um, it's just easy to do maths on, on these vectors. Some people try to force a notion that each dimension has a semantic interpretation. That's not really the case. That's not what happens. Uh, in the examples uh, that I showed you, it was a bit made up just to, to kind of prove the point. But it's not really, you don't have a semantic meaning for each dimension. and um, I uh, I finished the talk without saying neural networks. These models are based on neural networks. Uh, I chose to avoid the, the term itself, but you know, in neural networks, what's going on inside the model? <laughs> Nobody knows. <laughs> Last question. Because it is the last question, so yeah. it's more Please. of a philosophical curiosity. Yeah. Um, I think in, in the some years ago there was a race to improve this algorithm to understand decently the human language, mm -hmm. and now that we have reached this pretty decent level of accuracy, uh, there is a race from uh, people trying to be understood by the algorithm themselves. If anybody has to do with search engine optimization, knows what I'm, I'm talking about. So 
there is, do you think there is an effect of uh, content writers starting to write targeting the computers instead of targeting other people? And so ending up having a lot of content, which if you read it, has very low value or very low meaning for the human who is reading it, but has a very high value for the algorithm who is reading it. So we, we end up in a world that's made for yeah. computers. And yeah. Not for humans. yeah, that's a very good point. So uh, the I think, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, your model is only as good as your data. Um, if you have... Uh, some strong bias in your data that will end up also in your vectors. So with this Google News, um, you know, if you talk about uh, this US-oriented Google News, so for example, Mexicans, they're very close as a vector, they're very close to uh, illegal immigrants. That's a strong bias, right? And uh, if you have bias in your data, they will end up in your, in your uh, vectors, that's true. And it's true also uh, if you are a copywriter and you, you kind of force uh, this bias to be, uh, to be there, uh, there might be something going on. But there is some research also in that direction, so these bias are kind of easy to, to spot and uh, uh, there are some options for treatment, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. but. Uh, it's a good point, and uh, people are aware of that now. So before you, when you train your model, before you throw it uh, out in the wild, uh, you know you don't want uh, an evil AI to be out there. You want to kind of check what's going on before, and um, hopefully you want to try to filter these kind of biases. Uh, but then again, uh, you mentioned in copywriting, uh, but not all, not everything is about the web. A lot of companies they have their own data, and they might be clean in different ways. So. Yeah, it depends on the application, on the data set, on everything. But it's a good point to, to keep in mind. Okay. Thank you.